Y'all ready for another one of Fluffy's hot takes that isn't as much of a hot take as it sounds? The logic behind the idea of technical debt can be reversed to your advantage. If you're unfamiliar with technical debt is, it's just the idea that doing things sloppily incur a technical debt that you have to pay off later on in the future because that sloppy code is hard to build on top of. But as I said, that concept can be flipped around to create circumstances where you'd want to write bad code for some kind of benefit. For many types of software projects, there are times where you should write what is commonly referred to as bad code. Before I get into things, I want to make it really clear that I'm not saying that you should always write bad code or even that there are circumstances for everyone where they should. Some people will never run into the circumstances I will be talking about in this video, but most people will. I'm just familiar with the subject since I've been in the circumstances I will be talking about for most of my projects. I've participated in over 20 game jams where I've had to make a game in under 48 hours. This forced me to quickly get used to the concept this video is about. When you're in a game jam, the only thing that matters when you're done is the quality of your game. The structural quality of your code does not matter as long as it works as intended. Game jams are somewhat of an extreme case for this concept, but it applies in other areas as well. Initially, it sounds like you should only write bad code in extreme cases like game jams where nobody cares about the code, but in reality, you can take it a bit further and save you more time on some even bigger projects. The fundamental idea here is that you should write bad code under a few conditions. First and most importantly, it must be faster to write the bad code than the good code. After that, you must consider the areas of readability, performance, and extendability. For all of these areas, they need to be either unnecessary or your bad code must be doing good enough relative to how much time you'd be saving by taking the short route. Before going to examples, I should add that I've worked on projects on both ends of the spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you have games where almost nobody cares what the code looks like and you rarely ever have to touch the code again. But on the other end, there are projects where all the code should be written to the highest standard and you shouldn't write any bad code, such as in my experience embedded software for rockets that must be continually updated for newer rockets and regulations. Now if you try to apply the three areas I mentioned before to game jam games, you really only have to be concerned about performance. Readability and extendability don't need to even be considered if the code isn't going to be extended or read again in the future. Also, since game gem games usually aren't that complicated, you typically have a lot more room for sloppy algorithms, so even the performance area isn't particularly strict. Considering these points, I usually write whatever code reaches the goal in terms of functionality while taking the least time to write when I'm participating in game jams. Things like object-oriented programming go out the window. Most of the things in my games end up being represented by arrays rather than objects when I'm in game jams. Just knowing that a certain value exists at a certain index in an array, rather than typing out the full name of that value every single time you want to use it, saves some time. Another example where I write bad code is actually for my tutorials. I write some structurally bad stuff that is intended to be either easy to read or quick to write for the purpose of the tutorial so that I can get my point across as quickly as possible. This is actually part of why I don't use object-oriented programming in my tutorials. The next example is derived from the model I follow more generally when working on larger solo game dev projects. It allows me to make games so efficiently that I'm able to make almost $25 an hour while only getting gross sales in the four digits. The first thing I think about whenever I'm working on a new feature is what it'll be used for. This is important to think about for a variety of reasons, but one of them is the amount of effort you actually need to put into the implementation. If I need an inventory system, for example, I think of how it will be used and adapt its structure to those needs. This goes both ways. Don't over-engineer a system for a general purpose if you know what it's going to be used for. Just design it for what's needed instead. I've seen this issue a lot in freelancing, and it can be a huge time sink if you're not careful. There are circumstances where you can't narrow down how an element will interact with other elements, such as a project that's being continually updated. But if it's an issue of design work that just isn't done, finish the design work first.
There's another case where the interactions relating to a system can't exactly be narrowed down that's a lot more common to deal with in game development though. When you're working on a game, it's important to be able to playtest and adjust the features of the game according to your findings as you develop the game. This means that you can't, for example, know exactly how a weapon system will interact with the rest of the game until later on in the game's development. For me, optimizing development largely consists of analyzing the different features to look for ones where the interactions are more set in stone. The HUD, or Heads Up Display, is a great example of something that you can write bad code for to save time. Normally the HUD, but not necessarily the rest of the UI, does not serve as an input for anything. It just takes the data and shows something on screen. You can write tons of bad code for a HUD as long as you don't need to change it. You will have saved quite a bit of time by doing this. Typically, I'll write spaghetti for many of the rendering elements since usually none of the code takes input from the output of the rendering elements. If you're careful about breaking down elements of a project that doesn't have to be updated much after release, you can find other elements that you're able to write sloppy code on and save time. In Vagrant, my current project, some of the elements I wrote sloppily were the following. The background rendering, all of the visual effects, the destructible drop level editing system, the entity specific AI, the ability specific weapon logic, the HUD and inventory UI, and the entity spawning system. Additionally, I used slow algorithms for a variety of features since the impact is so small relative to the performance cost of those features. The code itself for these features isn't sloppy, but the algorithms running it aren't very efficient. Anyways, on the other end, some of the features that I could not write sloppily were the following. The entity class, the tile system, the item system, the level loader, and the core weapon system. You can't know exactly how many of these core systems will be used later in the development cycle, so I find that it's best to keep their design flexible and to write as good of code as possible for these systems. I like to imagine the amount of time spent on an element as a slider, where an increase in time is correlated with more extendability to make it easier to build more elements on top. An increase in time also results in more readability, which plays into extendability by making tweaks easier to implement. And of course, depending on the circumstance, it can lead to better performance. The goal of extendability and readability should be related to the idea of technical debt. You write things well so that the things you build on top are easier so that you can save time. You invest time early so you don't have to pay interest on your time debt later on. However, the main point of this video is that you don't have to pay your time interest if you never have to work with a feature again. It's like an absurd circumstance where you just take out a loan and you never have to pay it back. So the goal is to find the trade-off where the initial time investment results in the least amount of time spent in the end while still meeting your performance goals. Keep in mind that the end of the project, as I'm saying it, can only be, be defined by when the code no longer needs to be updated. Even in continually updated projects, the, the end still frequently exists because in many projects there's a point where the entire code base will end up redone. This concept alone has saved me hundreds if not thousands of hours on my game development projects and I hope it can help you too. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.